I am uh, filling in as chair for now for logistical reasons that Gabe will describe. So I will call to order and ask uh, that the uh, roll be called. Board member Corsi? Here. Board member Gonzalez? Here. Board member Judy? Here. Board member Ravis is absent. Board member Rogers? Here. Vice Chair Petra? Here. And Chair Fleming is absent. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of board member Abbott and Chair Fleming. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Gabe, do you want to describe the logistics about uh, uh, Victoria's participation? Absolutely. Non participation. Yes. Thank you, Vice Chair, and uh, good afternoon, members of the board. Um, Councilmember Fleming, or in this situation, Chair Fleming, um, has had, had every intention to join us today. Um, her desire was to participate remotely under traditional Brown Act requirements, which require a posting of the physical address. Um, we had an administrative error on our end um, that we truly do apologize for to both the board and Councilmember Fleming. Uh, she will be participating as a member of the public today and commenting as such, so she will be here. Um, and is interested in this conversation. Um, and because we'll, we'll have some beefy topics today, especially when we get into some projects, we will be continuing this item, not in the sense that the item is moving off the agenda, but continuing the conversation into the next meeting to provide opportunities for board members that aren't here today uh, to be able to provide comment and get questions answered. Great, thank you. Uh, approval of minutes, are there any changes or is there a motion to adopt the minutes as provided? Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, uh, unanimous consent, no vote needed. Uh, let's go on to public comments on non-agenda matters. Any members of the public participating? It uh, looks like none. Public comment uh, on non-agenda matters is closed. We can go on to uh, item 4.1. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, so item 4.1 is a, just a general status update of where we stand with the EIFD and specifically the infrastructure financing plan. So in our last conversation, we discussed uh, some of the challenges with moving the document forward at this point. Um, we really are trying to pin down the specific projects that will be included in the IFD. We have the tax percentage, and then we also have this piece that wasn't discussed heavily in conversations, but the boundary. And we have proposed boundaries. The boundaries can shift at this point. Is the boundary the best option for the project that's brought in? Uh, so we've had conversations with the county on how we could get input on projects that the county could support and tax percentages that the county could support. That took the form of a workshop in front of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, that was back on April 30th. And how we left that is to really move forward. There were the three pillars that we need some level of clarity on. And those pillars are the project list, the boundary of the project, um, as well as the tax increment. Um, so that at this point, the county is planning on reactivating that conversation in April. And what our hope is, is as we get an idea. July. July, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, so as we get more clarity, um, what we do understand is that there likely will be projects that the board will like um, and can support, but also there will be a desire to understand what the return on the investment on those projects look like. I, I think that's a critical component to the county participating in EIFD based on policy. Um, so what our next step is on that front, if we're able to shrink the projects down to areas that we can support both on the city and the county side, uh, we'll start doing additional analysis on those projects to understand what the return is to the district, um, the city as a whole, and how that impacts the county as well. Uh, so that's really the game plan moving forward. Uh, so just a reminder, our infrastructure financing plan is sitting in a draft state. We have put 50% in the tax percentage as a placeholder. Uh, so that's really to do some of the mathematical calculations. Behind the scenes, we're also working on the surveying exercises. Um, a map meets and bounds de description of the overall boundary is developed by a surveyor, and there has been work put forward to do that. So at this point, we're trying to tee up as much as we possibly can. As far as the overall timeline goes, uh, it is likely based on the feedback that we receive in July um, that we'll need a few months to be able to work with those projects to look at the various analysis that needs to be performed to understand the financial impacts. Um, that will be brought forward 
to the board, to the PFA. We're looking at trying to get alignment really between the city, the county, as well as the PFA, because each step in the process requires approval from those bodies. Um, so we'll understand what that looks like um, as we get more of an idea of what projects we're focusing on that lets us put all the work in to move it forward. Um, it does not have to be perfect as a public draft, but we do want some of these critical elements figured out. Um, and the projects are really the specific element that I think is, is going to take the most amount of attention. If the projects can be agreed upon, you can understand the return on investment. It's much easier to make a decision about boundary changes that that project needs to implement to ensure that we're creating a nexus between the district and the project, um, but then also to understand the tax percentage because you have a better idea of what you're getting for the tax percentage. So I think moving forward, there's going to be a significant focus on the projects. Um, just as a summary with the board, um, in April, we presented a lot of the projects that we had seen before. A uh, concept that was daylighted that I don't believe was daylighted in front of the P, uh, PFA is really projects can occur outside of the boundary. And we discussed the county complex, but the fairgrounds were also brought up as a general idea in that conversation. Um, so that was mentioned. And really, anytime we're working outside of the boundary, and I think affordable housing is, is a prime example, if you're building affordable housing outside of the boundary, you can argue that it benefits the boundary based on the fact that it's workforce housing and commercial benefits from that in general. Um, Fairgrounds obviously has that nexus connection as well. Um, and then we're willing to really look at other projects that, that benefit the city as a whole, but obviously we have to create that beneficial connection back to the district. And that's going to be one of the challenges with the projects. So that really catches us up to where we are. Um, our goal at this point would be to try to get a finalized draft IFP by the end of the calendar year. We really want to hit this tax year, but that would give us plenty of time to work through the public review process in the next half of uh, next calendar year. And we would just be looking at finalizing those documents by generally June. Um, so that, that's the target. Uh, there's various ways to shrink that down a little bit. Um, I just wanna reiterate, I understand these are very difficult conversations, both on the city and the county side. Um, and I think understanding a good process and, and coming up with a good product at this point um, is more important than racing things to the finish line. So we're trying to create a little more padding in there. Um, and I also wanna be respectful of the PFA's time. Um, you know, We wanna have really good conversations in front of the PFA. So there might be stops when we don't discuss items. Um, but I want to make it as transparent as possible that the PFA knows why and what we're working on in that time frame. Um, so there's an understanding that we're still actively moving the process forward. Um, so with that, that uh, finalizes my summary and happy to answer any questions regarding that topic. Are there questions for Gabe? Not at this point. Questions. If I could just clarify, I believe that the conversation for the um, County contribution is actually going to your board, the board of supervisors in August. August. Okay. So it is coming, but it may be a little bit later than July. Yes. And we have that worked in our timeline as well. Great. So if a little more padding is needed there, that, that's factored into our overall schedule. A question and observation, Gabe. The downtown community in advocating initially for the for the uh, EIFD was focused on significant uh, improvements to the downtown core, as you know, intended to generate additional tax increment income. And that that is one particular road, let's say. Another particular road is some of the other things that have been discussed, things outside the boundaries, the notion of large scale, other kinds of public projects. Uh, I would observe that there may be at some point a kind of fork in the road in the discussion about which direction we go. So I'm just making an observation and, and also inviting any other views that at some point that fork in the road is gonna to have to be identified and decided on. Not that it has to be all one or all the other, but it is philosophically some fundamental differences in which direction one goes. Excellent point, Vice Chair. And I think as part of this process, when we understand the list of projects that can be supported on both the city and the county side, they may be different. They may align in some areas, but the city may have more of an interest to fund some of those elements that provide that downtown benefit, where the county may see more of an interest to focus on the bigger projects. So one of the conversations that we've had internally, um, and I know the county has consultant services working on their side now as well to assist with the EIFD, is how do we make sure that all those interests are met in an overall EIFD? Because it can do a variety of different things. And I think when we get that to that understanding of those project types, 
And that bigger need across the board isn't necessarily aligning on both sides. How do we either create the alignment or figure out a creative way where the EIFD can fund those projects with maybe the city's contribution going to the projects the city really wants to see, and then the county understanding exactly where their contribution goes. So that's an excellent point. And I think it's it's really in the fine points of creating the EIFD. And I think it'll be really helpful now because we have consultants on our side, as well as a consultant team on the county side working on this. Um, we have meetings scheduled in the next week for the two consultant teams to, excuse me, next month for the two consultant teams to get together and start brainstorming around this concept. Um, because I think what we've seen is historically when counties and cities are involved in the EIFD, it can, it can run into these types of challenges that the interest is just different on the two sides. Um, so we're, we're leveraging as much regional experience as we can to bring that into the conversation to understand how to tackle this challenge. Yes. Yeah, just... Um... The term the EIFD once established, remind me again how long that is. It's 25, 30 years? 45. So, thank you. Sorry. 45 years. 45. 45. That's right. right. So, so given the fact that it's 45 years is the term, we're not one and done on a project list. I mean, the, the, what we've talked about previously has been having some flexibility to allow decision makers, elected bodies on both sides and, and or this organization group that continues or not, um, some flexibility in determining what those projects are. So just recognizing that, I think that we've talked about having criteria that give us that, that broad scope. I think that that's also really important. Yes, impact, yes, we wanna see tax increment growth, but we also wanna enable some flexibility for future decision makers. Yes. And I think that's an excellent point. And that was a lot of the flexibility that we had discussed in, the, in previous meetings is what we need now when we look out 30 years from now, what does it really look like? And how is it flexible to, especially in a public-private partnership, respond to what the private development community is looking at investing in and aligning with that goal? Um, so I think that that's the trick is specific projects, areas where there's more flexibility, areas where maybe the city and the county different, differentiate on the interest of moving it forward. Um, and how do you all that together and create a plan that can live over the 40 years. So, um, but, but as I mentioned, I think having more assistance in this particular case with a, a lot of years of actually developing EIFDs, um, it, it's really gonna be helpful to see the, the tips and tricks for addressing all those various components. Any other questions or observations under this item? I have one. Um, so if I may, to the vice chair's point around uh, this theoretical fork in the road. Staff will continue to hold the meetings necessary so there is alignment um, between county staff and, and city staff. Uh, ultimately though, we are implementing the direction that we receive from the respective policy making bodies, being the board of supervisors as well as the city council. And so to that extent, um, I would encourage any elected officials that are members of this body um, without violating any Brown Act rules uh, to have some of those offline conversations with one another um, so we can try to gain some alignment from the policymakers of both bodies, um, which will inform the conversations that staff are having as well. That's my observation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, on just a housekeeping item, I believe once the plan is adopted, the PFA then administers the plan for the life of the district. And depending on how the plan is written, uh, would have a high degree of autonomy, always subject realistically to what the governing bodies really want to see happen, obviously. Yeah. Yes, that's an element that is baked into the infrastructure financing plan to how those sort of course corrections, for lack of a better term, on projects or exercising priorities, how that works with the PFA running that, but also the both the city and the county having an interest in that. So that will be identified in the infrastructure financing. Are there any uh, public comments on item 4.1? Yes, we have one. Victoria, I'm going to put a three minute timer on for you if you don't mind just holding on a second. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me know when my timer starts. 
So, All right. uh, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this directly, but if I were there, what I would want to know is how we're doing with outreach with the the members of the community will end up voting on this when we when we consider the idea of putting projects that will benefit will have a sort of secondary benefit to the actual district through through revenues um, generated through outside projects and if we foresee any headwinds in that way and I just would would mention that we you know are are in a spot where we're trying to make you know please the county so that we can get agreement simultaneously with um, making sure that we can get the support of Oops. Chair Fleming, we've lost you. If you can hear us, we cannot hear you. That, that's it. I'll, uh, what do they call it? Um, I'll cede the rest of my time. Got all of comments. Um, thank you. Are there any other public comments? Um, there seemed to be a question raised about outreach. Um, I wasn't I wasn't clear if the question was in respect to the downtown community, which of course has been involved through the DAO advocacy of the chamber and other organizations, and a more broader conversation. Um, what do we think the answer to that is? Yeah, I, what I heard, and I'll be a little bit more direct, is has there been any communication to folks that they might be taxed for projects that are not within the district? So the way it would work um, is generally it's they're not it's not an additional tax. So as the increment grows through natural, it's just peeled off into that. So in generally with EIFDs, the amount of community participation, specifically when there's concerns about increases in taxes, isn't there for that reason. Yeah. So um, the outreach that we would do now when a project is outside of the district, there's two different things that we can do with that. Um, the, the project could not be in the district, has nothing but a revenue stream that comes out of the district and the taxes remain the same. Mm -hmm. And affordable housing would be, I think, a prime example. You could build affordable housing anywhere and likely create the nexus connection. Um, the other concept is to put those projects in the district, and the district can have a non-contiguous boundary. So you can draw an island around, let's say, the fairgrounds, and the benefit to the overall district is you would be driving revenue through redevelopment in that area back into the pot that is the EIFD. Um, so typically at this point, because I, I know there's quite a bit of community interest regarding projects and things going on to that effect, um, what we will do is that once the draft IFP is done, it goes public. And that's really when we start initiating the public hearing processes. There'll be more outreach to not only really members of the district, but also the community at large to understand what EIFD concepts look at. We'll do frequently asked questions so people can understand these fine points. Um, so right now we're still in that document preparation stage, which unfortunately has delayed a lot of that public outreach because we don't quite know what the projects and the boundary will be solidified at yet. Um, but once that occurs, and I, I would envision that to be towards the end of this calendar year as we get to the infrastructure financing plan, we'll really get moving with that public outreach. Thank you. Just an observation, although it's true, of course, that taxes for downtown properties or in properties within the district, whether downtown or otherwise, would not go up. It's also true that should the tax increment from the investments that folks are making in the core within the district be used to create projects outside the district and those which could be perceived by, by folks within the core as not necessarily serving the interest of defining the downtown as an even stronger community uh, core uh, is likely to have stormy weather. So, so be conscious of that when people hear the words fairgrounds, uh, that sounds a lot like, uh, like something that the downtown community and some others might have some trouble with unless a, a very pristine case was made. And I'm only speaking for myself right now from my own awareness of, of, of what some of the likely responses would be. And really appreciate the feedback and we'll factor that into the process. Um, just, if you've ever been to the fairgrounds, it's not very pristine in those barns. So. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, at what point uh, and by what process do we decide whether, uh, well, the fairgrounds, um, a site for, you know, a hotel or, or whatever, uh, 
becomes part of the district rather than being outside of the district? Mm -hmm. So, and that's an excellent question. I think what we'll do is that if we see um, a desire, and I, I think the, like I said, the fairgrounds is a prime example, just from a proximity standpoint. Um, when we get a little more input on revenue projections and percentages, um, really what it boils down to is the amount of revenue that you're trying to drive back into the district. So the more project costs that exist, you're funding it through a smaller boundary if you start doing islands of other projects, do you want to funnel that revenue back? And then how does that affect the financial projections of the district? So it'll be more of, I think, a mathematical calculation to understand the benefits of actually including it in the boundary or not. Um, we'll still, and I think it's to Mr. Futrell's point, there still has to be this core nexus back to the district. Like really, how, how do you create that beneficial use? So if it's the fairgrounds, what are you providing back to that core piece of the district? You can still create the island, but you're still part of this bigger district that's downtown. And what is the nexus? So are you driving more residential development downtown because of what, what's occurring in the fairgrounds? So we have to make that ne nexus connection. Um, but I truly think when it gets down to it, it'll, it'll be more of a revenue projection on how um, or or a revenue loss, really. I mean, that's part of the challenge that both the city and the county go through in this particular case is the tax dollars that would normally go to other things are now going into this bucket. Um, so I think when we get to that, there'll be more financial projection conversations about that. Um, but if we can understand generally where we're looking at location wise, the general project type, that helps us do that analysis and we can start crunching numbers to see what the impacts would be. We could also uh, create a uh, a tax percentage that is above and beyond what the normal growth would be, and not have to talk about loss to to parts of the district or areas of outside of the district. Um, you know, I, I understand what what you're saying, Hugh, um, and I just I think that there would be similar um, uh, headwinds to have the fairgrounds be part of the district, but not part of the benefit, benefit of the district. Um, so it's, it's a difficult conversation both ways there. Um, I'm trying to figure out uh, in my mind, and hopefully the, the analysis by two sets of, of uh, consultants will help me with this, but why would, um, why would, Anywhere where we're doing projects, what's the benefit of, of not having that be part of the district? Other than maybe a political dip, uh, benefit on one on one side, maybe I, I think it would be a political deficit on, on another side. And we can make that a rhetorical question for now. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I also hear the question, Supervisor uh, Corsi, what is the drop dead date, so to speak? where we can adjust the boundaries of the district that has been proposed, mm -hmm. right? Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, that was part of my original question as well. Yes, um, and we can get that definitive answer. Um, the short answer is we still have time to adjust the boundary. Now, once we introduce a public facing draft uh, Uh, not EIFD. Um, IFP. Infrastructure. IFP. It's too many acronyms. <laughs> um, the question then becomes, is there still room to adjust the boundary after the introduction of the draft IFP? So at that point, we're sort of resetting the process. So um, it would be really helpful to know the boundary changes now. So there's two components of the boundary changes. There is the work for the meets and bound description, which gets baked into the IFP um, to some extent, but it, it's the board of equalization on the back end, right? That's the formal boundary. Uh, if you're adding a single parcel to the boundary, that's not a big issue. If you're adding 300 properties to the boundary, there's quite a bit of work involved in that meets and bounds description. Um, so that's one component of it. Um, but the boundary is set initially as we go through this process. It can be revised, um, but you're, you're sort of setting it back. You're still leveraging a lot of the work that's been done, um, but you have to go back and set that boundary, go through the, the process again, form up the IFP, go out to draft, and then it goes out to draft with the boundary in place. 
Um, so a change in the boundary will affect the overall timeline, um, depending on uh, add the number of parcels, how big of a change it is, will affect whether that's a three-month process or a six-month process. Um, and I think really as we've sort of daylighted some of these critical pieces that we need, um, that one is really important, probably is equally as important as projects because it affects really the timeline and the mathematical calculations behind the scenes. When you get into the percentages, it's, it's much easier to play around with that because your foundation has been set for the rest of the calculation. It's fairly easy to say what the difference between 50 to 25 would be. Um, but if you have any moving items on the boundary or the projects, um, that's, that's really a critical element at this point to pin down. Yeah. Is it is it possible to to think um, perhaps more broadly about the the economic benefit that's created by projects outside the core when if you think beyond the terms of property tax revenue? So if you think of um, TOT or sales tax revenue, that you you potentially could think about some type of criteria for considering projects outside the boundary based upon how they are increasing other sorts of tax revenues that are out, not within the strict you know, definition of what's within the EIFD. And that's another way of thinking about broader benefit to the downtown community, you know, Santa Rosa as a whole, just to think about generation of other types of tax revenue that re would result from projects outside the boundary. Just a thought. And it's an excellent point. And I think when we do the return on investment with those projects, depending on where they are, and I know I keep going back to housing, but that is that is an interesting one because if you build workforce housing, is it benefiting people in the district? Is it benefiting the bigger city? Mm -hmm. um, the statute allows you to make that connection. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's fairly loose. I think when you get into whether it drives sales tax or TOT or property tax, um, then it becomes a different return on the investment on the city side and the county side mm -hmm. for, for that loss of sales tax dollars. So really, that's what we're hoping to uncover to the best of our ability within the timeframes we have when we have the project list. Um, a lot of these projects, and, and we'll, we'll see in the next um, agenda item today, when you have a bigger project, there's fairly robust feasibility analysis that go through that, and they understand really what they anticipate the impact to be. Um, we will not necessarily be able to do that full scope, depending on the project list that, that come up, um, but we're going to do our best to work with jurisdictions that have, have put those project types in to understand what sort of benefits they saw within what sort of time frame and where those benefits were, whether it's sales tax, other taxes, um, whether it's just the general better feel of an activity in an area, right? When you just have more business activity, have you increased permits? What came after that? Um, I think that's what our goal is with when we get a more defined project list where we're shrinking it down. And we will have those conversations in front of the PFA, um, but it's understanding more of that holistic benefit of those project types. Um, and then, as I said, that you know, with the city and the county, some may be more beneficial on the city's side than the county side. And, and that's what we'll figure out as far as think of some of the crossroad conversations and how we can be nimble with the um, infrastructure financing plan to address that. Any other questions, observations? Um, I don't know if I closed the public comments, but they're closed on this item now. And I think we're ready to go on to 4.2, Gabe. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, so 4.2 is a focus on a project that we have discussed in front of the PFA. Um, and really, as we move forward and we start talking about specific project types, um, I think this conversation is good to have. Uh, we have a lot of regional partners and other members of the community, and very much of this is a public-private partnership that are working on concepts. So if we're to understand return on investment and really what it means to put a certain project type in the area, and we have an opportunity to do that and add it to a PFA agenda, we want to do that. And this is an example of that. Um, so joining me today um, is Sonoma County Tourism. I know many of you know Claudia. <laughs> Um, so we have a presentation um, regarding the feasibility study for a conference center downtown. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Claudia and her team. And Claudia, you can come on up Ooh, and we'll get you. your slides going. Just bear with me for a second while I pull up the power. Yeah. Teresa. Yeah. Well, so I'm, my, uh, my house is far enough out of the downtown plan where there's no conflict. 
But if we start to pull in other properties in that area, can we talk about how to how to handle that? You can either go through or yeah. we're pulling it in. So right here and just yeah. Because I'm I'm between downtown between downtown and the fairgrounds. Did answer no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not right now, yeah. yes. but if but as we get into the consultation about what the district boundaries are, if yes. that's yeah. change, thank you. I go that direction. Yeah, for now, good, but. All right, thanks everybody. Um, Claudia Vecchio with Sonoma County Tourism. It's a delight to be here today. Uh, we are gonna talk about a, a project that we believe will be transformational. And those are the words of uh, Peter Rumble at the uh, Santa Rosa Chamber regarding a project that will really change the trajectory of Sonoma County and Sonoma County Tourism and its awareness amongst um, our really key audiences and uh, really could change a lot of things. I'm joined here today with, by Johnny Westham, who's our Vice President of Business Development. He's gonna talk a little bit about the meeting plan or component of this. Um, and then we wanna thank Danielle Nelson from Simon for being here and listening in on all this. They've become a critical partner in this project as well. So we appreciate for being here. We also will be joined on via Zoom by a couple of folks who will talk more about the ROI and the critical financing components of this that you all are particularly interested in. They can talk much more eloquently about that and certainly I can. We also want to thank um, Hugh Futrell for his help in this project. Um, we've, we'll talk a little bit about our partners in a second. But you know, we we couldn't continue down the road in this very new environment for us without having some great experts along the way. So we we definitely appreciate that. Um, we're going to quickly go through the project impetus just to kind of help you understand where this came from. Um, I've had this conversation with several in the room, and you know the answers to this. Um, so I'm I'm going to run through that fairly quickly, but certainly happy to answer any questions you might have about that, but um, the, there's a reason why this project is coming up and why it's coming up now. We'll also talk to some of our local partners. We certainly couldn't do this without great partners and um, folks like you and this this um, this great um, body that's, that's here and the decisions you all are gonna be making, certainly part of the partners that we will rely on throughout the uh, remainder of this project. We're gonna talk a little bit about the feasibility study. And we've taken out a large portion of the general feasibility study, which you might find hard to believe given the <laughs> bulk of the deck that you have in your, in your packet. But um, we have a, a large feasibility study that really showed us some fundamental um, assumptions about this destination as a, its capacity to even support this kind of project. And, Happy to again answer questions about that, but we're not really going to cover a bunch of that. Uh, we'll we'll talk through the test fit and architectural vision. It's always nice to be able to put a visual um, piece around this, and just so you can kind of see what we're what the, the architects and what we're looking at for this. Um, we'll also talk to the um, demand projections, and this is really where this conversation around the financial, um, both the return on investment and the uh, costs that go into a project of this scope, we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll talk about next steps. Um, but I uh, just wanted to kind of provide that overview for you where we are. Okay, the project impetus. So just as you know, um, the impact of tourism in Sonoma County is significant. Um, for 2023, and this was not a great year for tourism, for 2023 uh, tourism, uh, visitor spending into Sonoma County was estimated at $2.113 billion. This is done by a group that does this for destinations across the country, including Visit California, Dean Running Associates, and they do a uh, overall county spending and they also do spending by city. Um, the, the person who does that for us is on a medical leave at the moment. I'm happy to get you the 2023 Santa Rosa number, but I, I didn't have access to his email today to be able to find that for you. Um, Sonoma County uh, employs about 22,000 in the hospitality industry, and that includes hoteliers. It also includes um, those in, in tasting rooms and other hospitality and visitor-facing organizations. 
And then uh, the revenue, tax revenue generated from tourism in Sonoma County 2023, again, not a great year. We've had higher numbers than this in the past, but was $217 million. So uh, my, you know, certainly tourism is a chief economic driver for Sonoma County, for Santa Rosa. And I just wanted to kind of give you the lay of the land of all that. Please interrupt me if you have questions. I don't know if that's the protocol of this meeting, but I, I would love this to be a conversation as opposed to just talking at you. Um, we have a lot to get through and I don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna be here all afternoon. So um, the impetus, Sonoma County tourism back in 2018 and then re resurrected it in 2022 following fires and pandemics and all matter of crisis, um, created a 10 year master plan. And we did this through, gosh, we had conversations with uh, a variety of stakeholders, with business leaders, with um, residents, with elected officials, uh, with educators, with all, all types of folks in Sonoma County. We really asked a litany of questions about how they would like Sonoma County to move forward in the next 10 years to become a destination where people not only love to visit, because we know that's already the case, but where residents also feel like they're part of the conversation around how we create this great quality of life for them. It's a long process. These master plans don't just happen overnight, but um, out of that came five imperatives. And you see the five imperatives there um, to build a naturally resilient destination this week kind of gave us a reason why we have to be sure we continue to be very vigilant about our resiliency against natural disasters, but also as an organization, we need to be sure that Sonoma County Tourism has the funding and the resources required to be able to meet all the demands and needs of that organization as the years progress. The number three is to elevate the resident quality of life. That's critically important for Sonoma County Tourism to enhance the breadth of products and experiences Five is to acknowledge and advance Sonoma County's culture and heritage. So you can see it's a broad-based approach to destination, in our case, stewardship. But the one we're gonna talk about today is to strengthen the health of the, health of the region's economy, which Sonoma County Tourism does every day. That's why we, are, uh, why we exist. But within that particular imperative, and you can see that the master plan, which I'm happy to provide to anybody here, um, is a hefty document and each of these imperatives has a number of strategies, a number of tactics, long and short term, um, but each of them also has a big audacious goal, that stretch goal, that thing that would say signify that we had really gone to the, a great degree to accomplish the, um, the, everything that's included in each of those imperatives. And this one, it is to build a fully sustainable facility that could house meetings, special events, and other gatherings. We hesitated calling it a convention center or a conference center or any kinds of any kind of sort of identifier at this point because we really didn't know what that looked like. But that's where the where the uh, the process really begins. So, of all the things that we outlined in this master plan, that that project that was the most interesting to the widest group of people was the convention center. I mean, it's a big project. It's a transformational project. It's a project that people have been talking about for years, but the time has come for us to get really serious about figuring out a way to make that happen. So we put together a convention center advisory council and from it start, starting with Sonoma County tourism, we brought on some of our board members, especially those that are involved in development or in some type of um, real estate kinds of um, activities. And then we also brought together people who looked at this from the county standpoint. So we brought in uh, Ethan Brown from the EDB, John Stout from the airport, Larry Floor and Burbank Housing, Ty Mooney from the Alliance, um, a fellow named Howard Blickman, who's with a company that does these kinds of developments, although for performing arts centers more, more specifically. And we, we, we brought them together to say, okay, let's look at this from a county standpoint. Um, what do we need to do to make this work in Sonoma County? And the first thing we needed to do was to get a feasibility study, which I won't go through today, but we reached out to HVS, um, one of the leaders in this kind of work and said, let's be sure, first of all, Sonoma County is the place that can sustain and manage a convention center. So they went about a four-step four initial feasibility process. And the first one is to do that market overview, just to check with and make sure, go through their litany of, of um, types of 
uh, questions that they ask of a county um, to determine if we are, uh, we can support a convention center check. They then asked a, a series of questions of meeting planners, those who would actually be scheduling meetings. And Johnny's going to go through that because we have some interesting findings from that. Um, so they did that second. The third part was to come into Sonoma County and look at a variety of sites, really to determine from those sites which of those was the most desirable based on a kind of litany of evaluation criteria that they have. Um, where's, where would be the best site for this? And then the fourth thing they did, which I always forget about, so I'm going to check, is to do, a, oh yeah, the property configuration. We'll show you that too, how this, this center can be configured. So HVS, uh, the partner on the feasibility study, and then I will talk about 10SB because they were the partner on the architectural piece of this. Um, we have a, a great coalition of local partnerships and we appreciate Dariel and, and all, his, all he's done with the city of Santa Rosa. They've been supportive, they've challenged us, they've asked us you know, uh, tough questions, but at the end, I think we're, we're in good alignment about the potential of this process um, I talked about Santa Rosa Chamber and with Peter, and this has been on their radar for a while too. So I think it makes great sense to partner with them, the da Santa Rosa Downtown District, and then with the County of Sonoma. We've been socializing this with, with those folks. Obviously we're a county-wide type of an organization. So that's a critical partner with us too. And then with Simon, but that came in a little bit later. So I'm gonna let Jenny quickly go through the meeting plan of surveys. Is there any questions before we launch into that about how this all came to be and why we are where we are? Okay, take it away, Johnny. Cool, thank you, Claudia. Again, my name is Johnny Westman and I work on Claudia's team at the uh, at Sonoma County Tourism in the business development department, uh, which focuses mainly on uh, groups and meetings, uh, recruiting them to visit Sonoma County and stay in our hotels uh, for overnight stays and also to have their annual conferences, trade shows, uh, Board of Director Meetings, Executive Retreats, and those types of things. We also work with Travel Trade, which is international uh, representation across, around the world, uh, recruiting people to visit Sonoma County from outside the U.S. Uh, oftentimes, we have what they call incentive programs, where people from other countries or domestically will visit Sonoma County as an incentive destination for um, great performance within their own company. So, for example, um, IBM, if you had your top sales uh, managers, incentive trip for people who in the top 20%, uh, their company would pay for a luxury trip to a destination like Sonoma County. So focusing on those types of clients is critical for the, su the success of the destination, and also for our hotels. <clears throat> and while we, excuse me, while we would like to subscribe to the, if you build it, they will come theory, uh, we didn't want to rely on that solely. So we went out to a uh, about 77 hundred meeting planners within Sonoma County Tourism's database. And those uh, folks would have made it to the database by either one-on-one -on -one meetings with Sonoma County Tourism staff over the last 20 years of our existence, or through uh, newsletter subscriptions, or just coming to us organically, um, looking for information on the destination. So the first question we asked was, have you held a meeting or convention, trade show, or other type of event in Sonoma County during the past five years? Uh, excuse, uh, and the response is 46% uh, yes, 54% no. Um, the conference was the, the largest of the, of the group there, followed by incentive and then training the workshop. That is consistent um, from the industry standpoint, but also from our performance over the um, several years that I've been with Sonoma County Tourism and even looking back at our historic production. Just curious. Yes. Of the 54% that said no, do you know what the primary reason was? We're going to get to that in a few moments. Okay. Yeah, oh, excellent question. Um, so strengths and weaknesses of Sonoma County. In your own words, please describe what you believe to be the strengths and weaknesses of Sonoma County as a destination. Obviously, wine country uh, and, beauty, and beauty were the top two drivers for uh, strengths, followed by lots of activities, food, and weather. Uh, weaknesses we found to be air access, access to the destination that's through roads and just getting here uh, by a train or, or auto, uh, lack of function space, cost, distance to San Francisco, and then the papers off from there. Um, air access is an issue. Um, a lot of the meetings that we focus on nationally uh, want to have nonstop flights into their destinations where they're going to be meeting. Um, a lot of the, the groups that we go after um, tend to be the higher end of any organization. So they want to maximize their time and minimize their time making transfers. So uh, working with John at the airport on his routes and what he's doing there, making recommendations and having a 
good partnership there will hopefully increase the amount of air access moving east in the future. On the next slide, um, Lucy, please describe what you believe to be the most important improvements Sonoma County can make to enhance the area. More function space, air access, more hotel rooms, public transit, brand awareness, cost, large hotels, and alternate activities. Our largest hotel here is just over 250 rooms. Um, and in that, in that hotel, you, the function space in that hotel cannot accommodate 250 plus people uh, for, the, for the, all the types of different configurations that groups beg for, right? So a space that can be accommodated or can accommodate larger groups or also diverse groups uh, would be highly beneficial for the destination. On the next slide, hosting events in Sonoma County. Have you ever wanted to host an event in Sonoma County but was unable to do so? So to answer your question, insufficient function space, dates unavailable at venue because they're all filled up at those hotels, insufficient lodging, um, cost, and other. On the next slide, how would, um, in a positive light, how would you like, how would you consider holding events at Sonoma County Convention Center if, it, if one is developed? And this is called a net per, Motor score, net promoter score is taking the basis of the survey, those who were the respondents on that survey, and asking them what's the likelihood that you would, would support a project like this, you would promote a project like this, or you would utilize a project like this. And our HVS team is on the line and they've done a net promoter scores for a variety of projects across the country. And Sonoma County came in at 63, which is very, very high. And I believe, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, team that the only one higher that they've conducted um, in their research has been the Austin Convention Center. And yeah, that is correct. Yep, Johnny. And finally, on the last slide here, we'll, we'll, um, we asked what amenities are most important near a proposed Sonoma County Convention Center? Hotel rooms being number one, restaurants being number two, highway access, entertainment, public transit, retail, and so on. And this is consistent with most other destinations who we work with or who we've actually been part of in the past. Uh, we looked at a variety of or, um, spots throughout the entire county here, and we'll go through that in just a few moments, so I'm not going to spoil anything. But um, looking at the center that we're looking at now, each of these components um, is a strength to the location that we'll be uh, discussing here in a few moments without having to build the infrastructure around it um, as if we built uh, in a rural area. Thanks, Johnny. So in terms of the property configuration, and I'm not going to go through this because this is a lot of numbers, but I want you to know that HVS did look at all of the information we got from the feasibility study. They looked at comp sets. So they looked at convention centers in markets like ours and markets throughout the San Francisco Bay Area and came back with a suggested building configuration um, that does put Sonoma County's convention center in the right place as it relates to our competitors. And so you can see the square footage of all those rooms. And um, not only is this, we've, we've thought all along that this convention or conference center would also have an attached hotel. So the room configuration that they're identifying here, and you can certainly read through in your deck, but um, is not only uh, rooms for a convention center and all the breakout rooms required of that, but also meeting space in the attached hotels. And we went back and forth on what that should be, but this is the kind of the final configuration of those rooms in the hotel. And you'll see that in a second of how that looks visually, but this is a 250 Q room hotel with a 500, a 5,000 square foot ballroom and, and, and other types of meeting spaces. So we think that what, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just wanted to know yeah. what um, you mentioned that there were some other comparables for what jurisdictions were those? Yeah, so we looked at Monterey, which quite honestly is our chief competitor in this world, and they have a really nice con conference center if you've all been to that with a couple of hotels in the area. Uh, they looked at uh, conference centers in uh, South San Francisco, in Vallejo. Anthony, do you have do you remember the rest some of these other comp sets? Yeah, we looked at venues. Um, there's a Salem Convention Center up in Oregon. Uh, we really tried to focus on three sets of venues. One being oh, that slide. I think you just saw. Let's see. Yeah, I here. just do. Uh oh. Oh, there's that's forward. fun and games. Or else, anyway, while well, we, we figure this out, um, the first set would be hotels and resorts in the Sonoma-Napa area. 
that would pretty much compete for the smaller events that want to be on site in a single property. We looked at conventions and conference centers in California. So that includes, um, as Claudia mentioned, South San Francisco. Monterey is going to be the chief competitor for this venue, um, as well as some venues down in Southern California and in Southern Oregon. Uh, and then we did across the country. We looked at venues that are in markets about the same size as Sonoma, similar leisure destinations. And so we wanted to make sure they were in the right market for all three of those sets. Okay, thank you. Again, that's in the feasibility study, which we're happy to share, but there are many pages of comp set and comparable types of information. So then the, the group came into Sonoma County and we showed them 30 sites, everything from vacant lots to lots of land, such as the Sonoma Marin Fairgrounds, uh, yeah, to the um, Santa Rosa Fairground plot, to the, the Simon Center, to, we just showed them a litany of, of spots. They went down to the um, State Farm uh, plot down there in Rona Park, and they as, is, as I say, they went through a litany of evaluation components and came back with sort of their top seven spots. These are not a priority order. These are just the top seven spots. Um, and from there, then, they did uh, evaluations on each of those sites. And I, and I didn't include all of that in here because it's a, it's a lot of information, but they look at access to transportation. They look at access to housing. They look at impact to community and neighborhoods. Uh, there's just, a, again, a, a whole bunch of evaluation that they went through. And this um, on this slide, you can see that at the end of all of these evaluation, this evaluation matrix and the weighting that they put on this, that the site that came out on top is the Santa Rosa Plaza, Santa Rosa Mall area. Sorry to interrupt, Ann. Can you say exactly, I think it was 40,000 square feet was what they... We're looking at the, the ballroom itself is 32,000 square feet mm -hmm. and then the hotel and then the hotel is 5,000 square feet. Okay. Um, Sorry, that is not, what? The, uh, the convention center as a whole or the conference center uh, is 32,000 square feet, including the ballroom and meeting rooms. And then the hotel is an additional 8,000. So combined, the two can offer up to 40,000 square feet of function space, but the center on its own is about 32, a little bit over that. And, and what was the footprint then required? Well, it depends. Um, Go ahead. Again, the new mass. And... We did that with, with the, it, it kind of depends on the site. So it, it could be what the site will allow. So when we chose the, we looked at the Santa Rosa Mall, my first call was to Simon and said, this is, you know, where the, the site that is, has come out at the highest um, and we started to talk about what part of that mall would be even open for this kind of development. And uh, they initially were philosophically interested in this. And they said, OK, let's look at that Sears site where the old Sears building is. And then, of course, the auto mall that's kind of kitty corner in the back, that was also available to us. So then that's when the massing and the test fit came in, which I'll show you in a second. But it would really depend on the site and how that was all configured. There are some challenges with that site, but um, in terms of the capacity, the allowable capacity of this, but um, I think we put together a, a really compelling uh, look at that. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Anthony to talk about the hotel supply and demand piece of this, or John, John, are you on as well? I am here, yeah. Okay. All right, so I'll turn it over to HVS to talk through these slides. Sure. So um, it's, this is kind of a condensed version of, of our feasibility analysis, but this kind of gives an overview of uh, existing hotel supply within Sonoma County. Um, as illustrated, you know, Santa Rosa has the densest concentration of hotels in Santa Rosa, which supports, um, you know, some of the, the logic and reasoning to have a, uh, you know, convention uh, center in in kind of the heart of of Sonoma County. Um, this uh, slide presents, um, I guess, the the new supply pipeline in terms of new lodging facilities within Sonoma County. Um, we have seen a significant influx in supply, particularly along the U.S. Highway 
Highway 101 corridor between Petaluma and Santa Rosa in recent years. Um, as I'm sure you guys have, have seen, you know, we recently had the new home too that that came up in Petaluma, but also, you know, there's a brand new courtyard down there. And um, it's it's been a very hot spot for development in recent years. Um, so the pipeline is strong. Um, currently where we are today, um, <clears throat> coming out of COVID in a high interest rate environment, you know, the, the new development have have kind of stalled at this point given where construction financing is at but we are expecting you know that to uh resume and and continue with with new construction once um you know interest rates kind of moderate further and we see further improvement in terms of rev par um i think maybe the biggest thing to note though is similar to national trends we don't really see any large nationally branded full service hotels being proposed for development the, the bulk of um, new development, at least along the 101 corridor, is primarily limited and select service in nature. And so that that kind of refers to um, what they're offering in terms of F&B, so food and beverage, as well as meeting space. Um, so it's more limited or select in 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 scope. You know, so that's offering maybe breakfast or maybe um, breakfast and, and, and you know, uh, drinks and, and snacks for dinner. Um, those are kind of the popular development models at this point in time because they're they're lower in cost. So... Um, this this convention center hotel represents a unique opportunity to kind of fill a, a void or or gap that we don't see in development um, uh, typically these days. <clears throat> Next slide, yeah, please. I, I, yeah, and I would say that limited service hotel component of this is something we are working very hard to shift because that is that is not in the best interest of Sonoma County. I would say that anytime. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So th this slide is is looking at, or at least um, taking into consideration what we see in terms of competitive new supplies. So after identifying a site in, in downtown Santa Rosa as, as kind of the basis for our analysis, we looked at that list of projects presented on the previous slide and identified what would likely move forward, um, or most likely move forward within the next five to 10 years. Um, and the two that we had identified, one of them is Theraldson Hospitality's Residence Inn project on, on uh, Round Barn Boulevard, um, not too far from the, the site of the former Hilton and Fountain Grove, as well as um, a Hyatt place that had been proposed by Landmark Hotels out by the airport. Um, Theraldson is a very large nationwide developer who recently opened up the Hampton on the north side of Santa Rosa. Um, and have many projects in California, a bunch of new hotels they've recently developed in uh, Pleasanton, a project in, in Novato. Um, they're very active. Um, so these are the, the, the projects that we've considered. Um, but keep in mind that this is representing a, a snapshot in time uh, today. Um, you know, if this study continues to move forward over the next several years, this list will likely evolve depending on as uh, construction financing comes back and, and as projects move forward. But this is, at least from today's perspective, what, what we estimate to be considered reasonably competitive new supply. Um, this is our presentation. So we our analysis runs a supply and demand forecast. Basically, we are forecasting market occupancy and average rates, ADRs. And then we position the proposed convention hotel based on penetration. Um, to that market average. Um, so looking at existing competitors and seeing how they perform relative to the market and making similar assumptions for this proposed hotel um, and, and positioning it based based on our understanding of its its price points, its amenities, uh, et cetera. So again, that first step is, is taking a look and looking at a forecast of the market-wide occupancy. Um, also taking into consideration, you know, how new supply that we identified on the previous slide um, you know, influences uh, overall supply and demand as well. Um, so I guess big picture is, you know, where we have seen a moderation in occupancy, particularly in 2023, as hotels, um, you know, experience a loss of transient demand. Um, that last year was a summer of European travel. Um, and, and we're still continuing to see a little bit of moderation in the 2024 statistics to date. Um, but thereafter, Sonoma County is tied hand in hand with the recovery of the San Francisco Bay Area being a you know very important drive to destination, um, but out 
you know, in 2028, 2030, when this hotel is opening and stabilizing, you know, we expect the market to kind of recover back to those pre-pandemic metrics. So um, going from about 65, 64% today, um, all the way up to 75%, um, you know, almost eight years from now, uh, which is uh, illustrated here again. So this is taking our, our forecast of market occupancy, showing you historically how the market's performed. You can see a big spike in demand in 2018 as a result of the aftermath of the, the fires um, and heightened commercial demand. So FEMA, insurance, displaced residents, et cetera, um, kind of normalizing in 2019 and then a big dip for 2020 during COVID. Um, but uh, as you can see, we are not stabilizing at the peak of the market, nor are we stabilizing at the bottom. We're, we're kind of at the uh, a, a fairly healthy average from pre-pandemic performance levels. We, of course, would like to see this go up much higher and much more quickly, and we will work to make that happen, but this is their forecast. Um, and so similar projections. So this is looking at where average rates are um, historically and where we are, expect them to head uh, in the future. Um, I think the biggest thing to note on this slide is that historically, there was very strong growth um, above inflationary levels between uh historically so between 2010 and you know 2019 the market was growing at roughly 4.3 percent or over four percent annually um and we our long-term expectation of inflation is at three percent so um healthy levels of adr growth um which is expected to kind of continue as the market improves uh hand in hand with with um the economic recovery of the bay area as well and I think I'll turn it over to Anthony for the convention center demand projections. Great. Thanks so much for that, John. Uh, thank you so much for the time this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to talk you through our demand projections for the convention center and how we put these together, how we test the reasonableness of our projections, and then what that looks like in terms of attendee, room night generation, event generation. So here we have our facility and we had to assign a timeline to this project. So we assumed the hotel and the center would open in 2028. That's not a known schedule. That's not a strict schedule. That is just a timeline that we had to assume because the center has to open some year. And so we chose 2028. And usually when these facilities open, event planners are very, very cautious people. They want to make sure the lights work, the pipes work, the food is good. All of the mechanical and technical pieces of the building work before they want to put their biggest and best events there. So usually when a facility opens, it takes about three or four years for demand to stabilize. So we open and some event planners say, oh great, I know we wanna go in Sonoma, we're gonna go for it year one. And then year two, some more see, okay, the building works. They bring more events, more people. And then we have what we call demand stabilization about four years out. So here you can see when the facility opens in 2028, our nominal 2028, we have about 230 events, and the majority of it are meetings and banquets. And that comes from that meeting planner survey Johnny talked you through, where banquets and meetings are the most attractive event type and most want to be in Sonoma, and also by the operation of other venues that you'll see in a later slide. Uh, once demand stabilizes, we get up to 345 events in a year. The majority of that are meetings and banquets, um, but there are about one convention and conference a week for a total of 50. You can see our, oh, sorry, can we go back right. there? No problem. You can see um, our average attendance parameters we're assuming in each year, the average event size will not change from 2028 to 2031. And so we have a total attendance growing from 60,000 in 2028 and stabilizing just over 90,000. And so now that we have our events that we were projected, we want to test that. We want to make sure that this is rooted in how other venues operate. And that can be a tricky situation because every venue is different. They pursue different types of events. They're in different types of markets and they have different types of event space. So we gather a sample of five venues that all have their own, we'll say quirks and differences to the proposed venue we have here but we want to make sure that we average it across a large enough number where these quirks average out to a certain degree. Um, and you can see we compare the set average to what we're projecting in our stabilized year. And frankly, there's a little bit of an outlier. I just want to call out in venue two, uh, that venue is in a state capital. And so there are a ton of 
legislator and government meetings that happen. Um, so that really pushes up the set average to above where we are. If we take that out, we think our projections are right in line with how a lot of these other venues are operating. We also want to make sure our attendance projections make sense and that they're rooted in how other venues operate. So we perform the same analysis. We look at the total attendance by each event type and we compare it to what we were projecting in Sonoma here. And you can see Sonoma is marginally higher, about 88,000 to 91,000. And that mostly comes from the number of banquets that want to be in Sonoma. And when we say banquet events, that can mean a wedding, that can mean a quinceanera, a funeral, a reception, a charity gala, all sorts of different types of banquets. So it's not just your charity gala, it's all sorts of formal meal events. We do the same analysis with our average event, average attendance, and this has a little bit of variation in it. And that's mostly due to the size of the venues and the type of function spaces they have. Uh, as we showed earlier, there's a 21,000 square foot ballroom and that's the largest event space we have uh, modeled for this venue. And some of these venues, you can see venues two, three, and four, they have some pretty large event spaces and exhibit halls where they're able to do some pretty big consumer shows. And we know simply we can't attract that number of people. We don't have that amount of space. So we are lower there, but we're also higher in other areas. You see in our assembly number, we do think we can get higher higher than some of these other venues. So there is some variation, but that's because unfortunately all of these venues are different. They're in different locations. They have different priorities and they have different markets they compete in. We then say, okay, we have our demand projections. We've rooted them in other facilities. We've made sure our projections are reasonable. How many room nights is that gonna generate in Sonoma County? And so we look at how other comparable venues operate, how many room nights they generate, and we break out these parameters by event type. So you can see a convention or conference attendee is much more likely to stay overnight and they also stay for longer. Those events are multi-day, two, three, four day events where the attendee is gonna spend all those nights in Santa Rosa. A consumer show attendee is much more likely to be from the local market area. They're gonna be from Petaluma, Healdsburg, the coast. They're gonna drive in and out, go to the gun show, the flower show, the horse show, probably not a horse show. That wouldn't be good in our ballroom. Um, <laughs> things like that. And so each event type attracts a different amount of people and we want to make sure we capture that. And so we're not just projecting, oh, 50% of people who come to the center are going to spend the night. We know it's going to vary by event type. And so that's how we calculate those. And then we get our total demand projections. So this shows you how event demand ramps up year over year in terms of events, attendees. And then at the bottom, you can see our room night generation goes from 21,000 in the opening year up to 30,000, almost 31,000 in 2031. And I would say the majority of these room nights are going to be in Santa Rosa specifically. Event planners like to keep attendees close. They don't wanna to have to shuttle them down from Healdsburg up from Petaluma. They wanna keep them as close to the venue as possible. And some attendees may stay outside the block. They may wanna stay on the coast. They may have friends or family who live somewhere in the market and they stay with them instead. So the majority of these room nights will be in Santa Rosa, but definitely not all of them. We then project some convention center financial projections. Oops. Sorry, was there a question? I know, but we're, we're going on it. We're still okay time-wise. We're, we'll we'll zip through some of this, but this is sort of I think probably what this group is is very interested in. So Anthony, if there are highlights we can zip through, that would be great. Great. All right, I'll do my best. So the way we calculate our financial projections is we use those demand projections that we previously showed you, and we say, okay, well, how much revenue are you going to generate by the number of attendees? If that's how that line item works. So food and beverage usually is generated by the number of people that are there. Facility rental is generated by how many events happen. So one consumer show is going to pay the same amount to rent the ballroom as another consumer show, and instead of calculating by a total attendees. So this is how we calculate our revenues. And these are all based on the operation of similar facilities. So these are rooted in how similar venues operate. And you can see here, this is how we test those projections. So we have four venues that we have calculated how much revenue they generate per person, per event, and then the ratio of sales to revenue. And when we started this project, Claudia was very clear that she did not want this to be 
a convention center that's in Sonoma. She wanted this to be a Sonoma convention center. And so we took that to heart and really stressed both in the building program and in our projections that the importance of having high quality spaces and high quality food and beverage. And so you can see we are a little high on our food and beverage, but that is because we are expecting these banquets and these meetings to really generate a lot of high quality food that Sonoma is known for and that people want when they come to Sonoma. We then calculate our is this, Yep. Is the assumption that the operator is a private entity, a public entity, a, a private entity? What's your assumption? So our assumption here is that some entity is going to own the facility, and then a third-party management company would operate the facility. Um, something like ASM is a very well-known venue operator. They operate things from as big as, I know, in... Um, Hawaii, they operate there as small as in Ontario, California. So they're a professional company that runs venues, books, events, and they're very good at this. And the cost of doing so, as you can see here in our expense parameters, a two and a half percent management fee that they take. So there would be a public entity that would own it, we think. There's another model that has a 501c3 model that could own it, but that ownership piece is sort of part of our next steps. We would have a management company that would manage it and Sonoma County Tourism would sell. It. So, I mean, that along with this management company potentially, but we haven't gotten that far. We know we'll sell. It. So that's kind of how that would be structured. Great. So then here are uh, expense parameters. And so we take these, we calculate, we know that all of these line items are mostly based on how much you sell. So how much administrative and general expenses you have is based on how many people and how much revenue you generate. Salaries are usually fixed, but all of these are what we call ratio to sales. So it's some portion of the amount of revenue you generate. And then let's go to the next slide. Uh, here you can see our pro forma. And so in the opening year, when events and demand is a little low, the facility requires a $730,000 subsidy. And then once demand stabilizes and ramps up to where it will be moving forward, the facility essentially breaks even. And I know this may be disappointing to some people who expect the convention center to be highly profitable. That is generally not how convention centers operate. We see in a lot of markets, they do require an operating subsidy. In Sonoma, we don't think that will be the case because we see so much excitement about coming to Sonoma, that 63 net promoter score. You see a lot of these more lucrative events like banquets, like conferences, not as many assemblies or consumer shows that have less revenue. And so the real return on investment of building the center is not necessarily the money it will make, but the economic activity that it will spur. It is, we used um, what's called economic impact. We use an in-plan model to calculate how much spending are these people going to bring to Sonoma, all of these attendees that come over the year. And we plug that into the model of the Sonoma economy. And we found that these new attendees are gonna generate an additional $42 million in economic impact in Santa Rosa, in Sonoma County, because these attendees, once their event is done, they're not going to want to just go back and sit in their hotel room. They're going to be in Santa Rosa. They're going to want to go out. They're going to want to eat. They're going to want to drink. They're going to want to shop. They may even want to wine taste, maybe try some beer, all of the things that Santa Rosa is known for. And so usually with convention centers, we see that that is what they are. They are social infrastructure that helps for economic activity. They're not their own self-sustaining business. You would see a lot more private companies building and operating these venues if that was the case. We have a question. Do I understand correctly that it's it's not until 2031 that you actually stabilize? There's, so it'll be a subsidy for four, 2028, 2029, 2030? For about three to four years, yes. The subsidy will decrease as event demand increases, so it will go down from the $730,000, but then it will break even in the stabilized year in the fourth year. So here you can see exactly what we talked about. In the first year, 733 gets down to 415, 233, and then we're in a stabilized year and we essentially break even. It's Caroline again. What's your assumption on um, inflationary increases in your operating expenses? It so me like they were variable. Um, 
So generally we use a two and a half percent inflation factor in our expenses. But the way that our expense parameters work is that some of them are more fixed than others. So essentially your utilities, for instance, whether or not you're in your first year with slightly less demand than your stabilized year, you're still going to need to keep the air on, the heat on, the lights, all of that. So some of it will be variable when, oh, there's no event going on, I can turn my lights off. That'll be slightly lower of a cost than once demand is stabilized and you have a, month, a lot more people in the building. So each line item kind of operates slightly differently with the degree to which it is fixed and needs to be paid. So salaries and benefits, you're going to need to pay your people year over year, no matter what. But your repair and maintenance may be slightly lower in the first few years because you have fewer people going through the center, not beating it up, but using it, making, putting in chairs, tables, dinging the walls, all of that stuff. So those expenses should grow by approximately two and a half percent, but some each line item varies differently by how it operates. John, can we be really quick with the hotel side of it? Absolutely. Um, so this is just a quick overview of our facilities recommendation, um, which we had previously discussed having 3,000 square feet of meeting space, several F&B outlets, um, pool, fitness center, et cetera, um, competitive with, with other hotels in the market. Um, next, next slides um, are related to the forecasts of occupancy and ADR. As I mentioned, we're using a penetration analysis um, in this regard. So if the market's stabilizing at 75% occupancy, we're assuming this hotel is running at 80% on stabilized basis. Um, you know, it, it is going to be one of the largest hotels in the county, but should benefit from its downtown location, which will drive transient business as well of, as its um, you know location adjacent to the convention center, which should allow it to significantly overpenetrate for meeting and group demand. Uh, and similarly, you can keep going on this. Um, uh, same for for ADR. You know, this will be one of the newest hotels in the market. Um, again, a premier location. We've assumed this is operating as a full service upper upscale. Um, type property, um, and and accordingly, we've we've positioned its its rate um, uh, in line with other up upper upscale hotels in the market. Um, this is just an outlay of our top line AUK and ADR forecasts with a comparison against the market. Uh, from there, once we have established those top line metrics, we go through our extensive database to pull comparable operating statements based on existing hotels that we've worked on in the past. Um, and the three comparable metrics that we look at is on a percentage to revenue basis, uh, per available room, and then per occupied room. Um, can you go to the next slide? And so these are presented. So this first slide is looking at um, you know five comparable full service hotels in California. Um, and, and comparing, you know, these are the metrics presented on a percentage of revenue basis. Um, next slide is, uh, per available room and the last slide is per occupied room. Um, and so we position the hotel based on, uh, you know, the comparables that are most similar in terms of location and product offering, uh, as well as price point. Uh, next slide. Uh, from there, then we will put together our forecasts of, uh, income and expense. Uh, so again, so similar to the convention center financial statement that we had seen, this is uh, our projections for the hotel, um, which is stabilizing out in 2032 um, and is, uh, you know, expected to make a, a healthy, healthy profit margin here. Uh, one quick assumption that's important to note is we've assumed that this would be managed by a brand. Um, hence, there's no franchise fees uh, being paid. To, an, uh, to a brand. Next slide, uh, same forecast in a, t in a 10 year format. Um, and next slide. And then Anthony, did you wanna hop in on the development costs and estimates? Uh, Claudia, do you want to take the lead or do you want me to here? Yeah, so so this was actually a, a, a compilation of a spreadsheet that a group put together. Uh, Hugh Futrell helped us with these cost estimates based on what he knew of uh, San Rosa Market. And when we talk about this convention center and the hotel piece, 
these are costs for the convention center site. So that, that's the publicly owned part. The hotel is a privately owned entity. So those costs would be borne by that private entity. But this does not include his acquisition costs. So if we were to go in and purchase that Sears property and potentially the Sears Auto site from Simon to figure out what that's going to look like, which is kind of where we are right now, um, then that acquisition cost is above and beyond this. To know you went through an extensive multi page um, uh, estimate, and this is just sort of culling down the high points of that. I have a question about this. Um, $570 a square foot construction cost. Um, it's a, a, a convention really center is a bunch of big boxes. Yeah, so I'm you know, familiar with construction yeah. costs. That's is that um, considering prevailing age, you know, public sector financing is involved. So you would have legally you have prevailing wage and a number of other California requirements that include prevailing wage costs at five seven years per foot. Yes, it includes prevailing wage costs, yes, bearing in mind that this construction type is type 1A throughout, and uh, the, this is the construction type in which the premium for prevailing wages uh, is the smallest, significant, but smaller than in type 5 or type 3 construction. We've, 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 had, we've had several discussions around that, and, and if it, it may very well go to 600, and if it's five years down the road, we may be looking at a very different mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Right. So yeah. all of that's taken into consideration. Yeah, just just a you know, some of your comparable uh, entities that built either renovated or built new experience significant cost escalation on their uh, convention center developments. And so just something to consider. Um, you may want to have a healthier contingency than 10% on the overall cost. Yeah, we also, that, that has come up as well. So then just quickly to go through, as we mentioned, we, we have this site, the Sears site, and so we brought in a architect to uh, provide a test fit and a vision for this location, that overview of the site with the uh, not only the Sears building, but a little bit in front in terms of the surface parking and then the parking structure in the back. And then that jetting out part is the Sears Auto Center. We asked 10SB to look at this. As Anthony said, we want this to be a Sonoma County Convention Center, not a convention center in Sonoma County. So they look at the type of materials and the very organic sort of natural materials that would be included. This is the potential for the facade of the parking structure, which at the moment is not particularly appealing. So we take a look at how we would kind of re-skim that parking facade. This is the, um, the center as it kind of would look from the, from the top. Obviously we have the, the conference center is at the rear of the facility. The sort of I shape is the hotel. And then there is a large outdoor courtyard in the begin in the middle of all of that. I'll show you how that is integrated here in a second. Um, this is the first floor. You see the exit it entrance from the mall on the first floor into this beautiful open courtyard that is sun bathed when it's sunny, and so it really does have a nice welcoming um, entry into the into the property. The first floor does have all day dining on the corner. Um, it has a wine education center is what we're currently calling it, but that's sort of a Sonoma County experience spot, the business center, the meeting blocks on the first floor. Uh, and then you can see a small boardroom in the hotel side, which is the sort of light beige piece of this. This is the second floor. That's where the main event hall is of the conference center. You'll see the hotel ballroom there. And then this is where the rooms start with the, um, with the hotel continuation of rooms. This is the top floor where there's also a rooftop restaurant, kitchen, private dining, and then the, the pool fitness center and an outdoor fitness and yoga kind of configuration. This is the site sort of from the top. You can see that um, the conference centers at the back uh, and then the hotel comes up to the to B Street. 
And I'll show you that in a second. And then over at the Sears Auto Mall section is actually probably a phase two uh, project, but we were kind of thinking of that as a big event space where there'd be an event bar and there'd be some agricultural components that would really be an homage to Sonoma County. Again, another viewpoint of that center. This then is the sort of the vision of what this would look like in, in retaining the, um, the natural beauty of Sonoma County. There's a lot of natural plantings on the podiums that you'll see those sort of sections as it goes up. We retain the redwood trees that are there. You can see the top um, with the wood um, facing uh, rooftop there with the rooftop restaurant and such. The, what, what they proposed and we like a lot is the idea of changing the, uh, the whole paving area so it becomes a district unto itself. Uh, and yes, cars can go down there, but you can you'll sort of see the separation of the, of this and the you know really keeping it a very green and organic kind of a place. Um, this is the hotel you see at the front, the entrance to the hotels on B Street there with the Portica Share, and then the conference center entrance is down with this first street there with the um, you can see the, the sort of vertical brown wood things that would be the entrance to the conference center. So there's a lot more that goes into this test fit, but based on time and, and what your purposes are here today, we don't want to be too much. Good question on that. <laughs> is it integrated with the Prince Memorial Greenway? That is a that's a great point. And I'm becoming better, more familiar with how that can happen because the idea is that it would um, have new lighting and new activations along the greenway so that is a safe and Fun. That, that was exactly where my question was going is with the test fit, you have a requirement to activate the Prince Memorial Greenway, not block it off like some of the developments no, have. No, absolutely. And that all fits into the design. Absolutely. Of the fit. It's all in there. And um, the connectivity between that and the Hyatt and, and Railroad Square, absolutely part of all of this. Um, but what I'm also coming to realize is that connectivity to the entirety of the Greenway and its, its capacity for bicyclists mm -hmm. and love that. And how we then down at that event barn maybe create a bicycle hub uh, where we may either rent bikes or really have that as a place. Because there's a lot of bike groups we could invite to Sonoma County because that would really position us very uniquely in that community. So we're learning more about that, but definitely that, that is a piece of it, part of this. All right, so our next steps, we are now in the funding piece of this, and we are we are going out to um, find a consultant who can help really put together what they call in their industry a capital stack and how we figure out the funding um, between a public and even private and how a tourism industry can help support this. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at really what that model's gonna, gonna look at for for the funding component. Uh, so that's that's really where we are. Um, we continue to work with Simon on this and um, they've, again, they challenge us. They've asked us great questions, um, but we are very early in the process uh, in, in terms of now putting together the real meat of this program. Um, we've sort of done the um, all the preliminary components and of course the test fit and the visioning is sort of the fun piece of this. And now, it, now that we really have to come up with the funding model. So that's kind of where we are. We're looking at a number of different things in terms of funding. So that, that concludes our, uh, the, the presentation of this uh, new idea, this new center and what it, we believe it can do for um, Sonoma County, for the city of, of Santa Rosa and um, a, a, I, I will raise my hand and say I am not an expert in this. I am pretty darn good at destination marketing, but we continue to get to these points where we look to um, our partners, where we look to um, consultants to help us kind of work our way over the abyss because there, there are times when it really it's like we, you know, we don't know where to go. So we are finding the best in the business to help us answer those questions. We are partnering with really smart people in Sonoma County to help us find the answers to those questions. Uh, but we know what we want to achieve. And once we have, as Stephen R. Covey says, begin with the end in mind, we've begun with it sort of the end in mind, and now we need to figure out how we get there. So that's 
That's where we are right now. Thank you, Claudia. Just an observation, an interjection sure. first, if I may. Since my name came up, I, I think I should stress for the record that uh, the role I've played is to provide some technical pro bono assistance. My firm uh, is not compensated in any way for that work, so that's important to, to stress. And uh, I'm not advocating at this time for or against the notion of the EIFD having any participation to help be a, a financing source. Uh, I also should mention that the cost work that I did, and co cost work when you don't have a design, uh, mm -hmm. this is, and uh, construction drawings is always an interesting exercise, um, but it was generic based on the objectives uh, that were outlined, but not design specific. Mm -hmm. For example, there are, is a, a very large investment that would be needed to uh, improve the facade of the existing garage structure. Uh, none of that, that was not anticipated in, you know, in, in, in the cost. Um, um, I also wanted to just observe that any financing package on, on convention centers are notoriously complex mm -hmm. and also um, deeply involved with political decision-making with multiple agencies that have to decide what they're going to do and, and not do. Um, a very good example of that is uh, um, the core of financing most convention centers in California uh, is most often through uh, hotel tax, uh, since hotels often benefit from it. Um, um, and most often increases to business improvement districts, apart from what a city gets through its TOT, there's typically an add-on, like in Monterey, a very large add-on to fin finance that. But there's a natural blue sky in, in how much total hotel tax between municipal TOT and business uh, tourism districts can be collected without having a regressive effect on hotel rates. Um, um, and at this moment, it's my opinion, there is some blue sky there uh, to make things work. Uh, but we recently heard that the, the city is evaluating, understandably, I will say, the notion of uh, increasing the city's TOT. To the degree that blue sky is used up, it will affect that financing scheme for the convention centers. And I thought it was just important to make that observation. And finally, um, um, the Sears site is the best site that we, has been identified, no doubt about that, above all because of the, the parking facility, which if it comes with it, it exists, and it is vast, would be vastly expensive to recreate if you had to. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are city garages on the other side of the freeway, but none of it is, is, is as good as this site. If this site, however, is not obtained, there is a site possibly, I stress possibly, on the east side of the freeway in the downtown core, uh, which ultimately might, might, might come up and has most of the same point criteria, I think, that HVS would have identified for this one. Um, I think it's important just to mention that because at this moment, there is no deal with, with Simon yet to, to acquire the property. So having said that, just by way of further background, uh, questions now for Claudia, Chris? Yeah, um, this may be more of a question for you, Dave. Um, are we looking at this as a project of the EIFD? Um, how would it contribute to the EIFD and or benefit from the EIFD? Well, so I think this is a project type that we can look at as part of the EIFD. Um, I know we've had those conversations in previous meetings, more of the catalyst projects. I think, you know, starting from the concept that there was really a desire to focus on the linchpin, the big projects that would move the needle downtown. Um, and then this was discussed. I think when we look at taking it sort of step further to see what financial benefit does the district get from a project of this nature going in? Where is it going to drive other economic development in the district? There needs to be an expansion of that study to better understand what that would look like. So that's essentially what the ROI is. Um, so I do see what the conference center is. It brings hotels, it brings restaurants along with the hotels. It creates that level of activity. And I think there's examples in other areas where that's happened. Um, you know, I think where we have talked about catalyst projects being really housing, it doesn't necessarily trigger housing. But do you have this chain of events where all of a sudden you're just improving the activity downtown 
and the housing comes to be a part of that. So I think that that's really the next step in some of this analysis, that if we say we think that there is a benefit of putting that downtown, we have to take that next step and understand financially what that benefit looks like. And is it appropriate for the EIFD to then fund that type of project? And then of course, how much? Because the intention of the EIFD is not really to be sole funding for a project. Um, it really covers proportionate shares of it. It may cover infrastructure improvements. It's, it's really sort of covering a piece. So when that whole um, sort of expenditure and revenue analysis put together to understand how to move a project forward, really it's, it's just a component of that. Um, and it can be other things as well. Um, so we just wanted to give an opportunity for the PFA to understand since this has come through that there are conversations happening in the community about this and then further have a conversation really as this moves forward is this is a type of project that there is an interest in funding through the EIFD. Does it have that benefit to check those boxes? But I truly understand that there will there'll be a little more analysis that's needed to make that finding. So for, for my board going into later on this summer, making a decision on tax uh, increment percentage, um, it would be good to have some analysis of uh, the tax increment produced by this hotel and convention center on a, on a property that's already paying some property tax, but what that might look like um, going forward. Absolutely, and Claudia and I were having that conversation a few nights ago, um, just about how we can take it really the next step, um, maybe leverage some work that she's already put into the process, mm -hmm. Um, but just then understand now that you see the visuals and understand what that would look like and it may be feasible, how do we get to the, the mathematical calculation to better make that decision? So um, we'll see what we can do in the short time frame um, with the understanding that July or August are moving forward. Um, I believe I mentioned earlier that we have an internal meeting with our team and the county's team next month. That's actually next week. I apologize for that slip of the tongue. Um, so that, that'll be an opportunity for us to try to tie some of this together to make that be a beneficial conversation in front of the Board of Supervisors. Thanks. Chris. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the presentation. I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to stick to sort of what the PFA is looking at and, and the, uh, the way that we're structuring it. But really, there's this looming question about the involvement of Simon and the feasibility of it. And how likely is it that we'll have some clarity there on whether or not this is a real potential when we are drafting the IFP to know whether this is even something to consider. Like it's a lot easier when it's city or government owned land that we're talking about potential projects with and improvements to that's private and does even the inclusion in it change the calculus from Simon's perspective of what they could potentially accomplish there, I guess is part of how I asked the question. Yeah, I, I would tell you that um, Simon at this point is supportive of this project. It is a project that they, and Daniel, I'm not going to still you know, speak on behalf of Simon, but um, that they are considering and are having people from Simon come, to, come into the destination to look at this. So it is something they are very definitely considering. They have not shut us down throughout this entire process. And we've had three meetings with them. They've said, and they've continued with us. Um, this, it, they have another developer looking at this same property. So we understand their, whether, you know, how competitive that actually is. I don't know. This very definitely provides them with a different approach to using that space. So, um, I can't speak for Simon, but I will tell you, they have continued to support us through this process. Uh, and they have asked us now to come back with what our option or offer would be. Um, so that's something where neither Johnny nor I have the expertise to do that. So we're looking again at a consultant to help craft that. Um, and so they continue to be supportive. It, but no idea of sort of what your timeline looks like and how that aligns with the timeline for the PFA. They they have they have rushed this process throughout the throughout it. I don't know that we would be at this point without this competitive nature of where we sit with Simon. So uh, when I my last conversation with them when they asked for the offer, they said, "Well, we don't need it in two weeks," and that was two weeks ago. But we know that they are anxious to figure this out, as anxious as we are. If I may, through the chair, uh, to underscore Claudia's comments, uh, 
I don't see a timeline where we deliver a draft IFP prior to the county's Board of Supervisors meeting in August. And again, just understanding uh, processes, timelines, um, assuming there's a definitive answer from the Board of Supervisors in mid-August, um, we're probably still looking at early September at the earliest to deliver a draft IFP. Um, and I have been on some of those calls with Simon. I can't speak on Simon's behalf, um, but I do agree that there seems to be real interest on Simon's end. And so that's a roundabout way to say uh, there, there is a high likelihood that there will be clarity on the Simon's end, on Simon's end prior to mid-August. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, I think it was 83 million uh, construction cost that does not include acquisition. Correct. We know what has been offered to that site in the past through various purchase. We know of at least one. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. So, you know, we know what those numbers are. Does it make sense today? Does it make sense given the total environment of what this means? You know, that we have to figure out all of that yeah. piece of what the uh, the offer through the chair. Yes, yes, sir. Um, the you mentioned that there was a the implant study said forty two million dollars in economic impact. Did that include the sales tax and TOT and the property tax? That's an HVS question. Yeah. So the way we calculate the economic impact is that's the amount of economic activity that occurs in Sonoma County because of the attendees that come to Sonoma. Um, and let me pull up here. Sorry, I just want to make sure I get my numbers right so I don't give you the wrong idea. And so the taxes that occur on that economic activity, that 42000 total about $3.2 million a year in annual fiscal impact. So that 42 million is the amount of economic activity. And then the taxes that apply to that economic activity generate a, an additional 3.2 million. Combined uh, sales and property. Sales and, and TOT. Sales and TOT. No property. No property. No property. No property. Sales and TOT. Yes. That's exactly the same model we use with our economic impact model. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. I'm familiar with them. Are there any other questions? Are there any public comments on this item? Pardon? I see none. I see none. Okay. Oh, any? I'm sorry. Victoria has her hand up. Ah. You have the floor, Victoria. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation um, and all the work that you've put into this. Um, I. One thing that just stuck out to me, especially towards the end of the presentation, is the the pressure of of the idea that there might be another competitor out for the Simon site in particular. And I am cautious against um, making decisions that are um, that are based in like a high pressure sale. I know that we would love to redevelop the site. But I also want to balance that with the fact that the site has has been historically really difficult to to partner with. Very little has happened on that site. And so I just hope that we're not um, going to react to the, the high pressure cell in this moment in time, especially when we're not sure about all of the information that we need in order to make a decision. So that's my two cents on that. And I, I will note that it is harder to make comment when you've got the timer, you know, going down on you. So I have a, a little bit of empathy for our public commenters, but that'll be the end of my <laughs> for today. Thank you. Uh, any additional st staff comments? Any? Yes, Chris. I, I think just for me, uh, moving forward, one of the things that I'm going to be looking at uh, and would be really helpful to keep an eye on is exactly that number that was thrown out uh, about uh, taxes generated insofar as that goes back towards the city of the county 
versus how much the the PFA would be putting in on a year to year basis. Uh, the the forty two million in economic activity sounds great, uh, but especially when you see three million back towards the services, it's got to add up to me. It's, mm -hmm. There's got to be a comparable return on investment by the government entities uh, that are dealing with taxpayer dollars. Any other comments? If not, let's go to item five, which is discussion of next meeting agenda. So for next meeting, and I really want to be respectful. I know we're in vacation season. Um, just as I mentioned before, timeline wise, we're lining up the Board of Supervisors conversation, July, August range. Um, we are having some internal conversations with the county before that point. Um, I'm always happy to provide a status update as to where we are moving forward, but I also want to be respectful of people's time and make the meeting as productive as possible. Um, so what we'll do is we'll try to build out that agenda. I think as a regular agenda item, it will be a status update. Um, but as we get moving forward, we're moving closer to that development of the IFP process. At some point, once that posts, then we're kicking in the public hearing. Um, so I should have a better idea of a timeline as these processes start moving forward over the next few months. And then just understanding a direction of how we're going to answer some of these questions about specific return on those tax dollars, the return on investment. Um, there'll be some work in that, but as we move forward, we're going to have more strategies when we have those consultants and consultant conversations on what that looks like. Um, so we will be prepared to have another strategy conversation. I think the Board of Supervisors meeting is very critical to understand that input. Um, so obviously, we're looking at an August meeting because that would happen after that date, it sounds like, um, to provide an update of how um, the, we're responding on our side with the information that the county's provided. Um, so at this point, what I would propose is just a general status update for July. Um, we'll feel that out as we move forward. Uh, we'll likely do a quorum check around that as well to make sure everyone's available. Um, and then I think August is the big meeting date where we'll have a little more meat to discuss as far as next steps go. Do you think that anything is going to change in, in, as far as status between now and July? I don't think so. I, th I think, um, you know, as... And when we have conversations such as this, where we can get the PFA a bit more comfortable about project types, um, I know we've discussed some of those bigger projects. Obviously, the Simon site keeps coming up. Um, but if there's any interest as we move forward, we'll try to program that. Um, but my guess is, uh, Mr. Corsi, as we get through July, there's probably not much more to provide input on. And then the August conversation, I think, is a bit more robust with direction and uh, more revised timelines. I guess my question would be, do we need to have a July meeting? That is your prerogative. So. That is. I, I, I can help guide it by I believe that um, we will not affect the timeline by moving to August. Um, I believe anything we can provide in July, we can also provide in August, and it may be a more robust conversation if we just move to August. And we wouldn't be bringing any action items to the meeting in July. I, I'm perfectly comfortable if we want to just sort of put a hold for July, but if the chair and staff determine that there's no real reason for us to have a meeting to release that, uh, but I'm, I'm good. We want to do that. And we'll be sure it's behind the scenes to work with Chair Fleming on the next agenda after this meeting um, to make sure that we're not missing anything, but I appreciate the feedback and we'll, we'll adjust for it. Kristen, do you know if we have um, a date for this on a significant items calendar? I believe we do. And looking at a calendar, I believe that it's August 13th. August 13th. No guarantees, but that's that's the target. Okay. And that can align too, um, because we're the third Thursday, we would be falling in after that. So I think that works out fairly well for the time. Anything else, anybody? With consensus. I'm sorry, for the, for the record, um, if we do have a meeting on the 18th, I won't be available on July 18th. Thank you. I think we uh, are adjourned. May I make comment on that? Okay. Oh, sorry, of course. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I was going to say it's been um, my my view that we ought to have meetings when when we have items and not um, not when we don't. So we'll pencil it in for July. And if we don't have a reason to meet, we won't meet. 
And if anybody wants to talk with me about that in further detail, I am available offline. Assuming no, um, yeah, that, that'll do. Thank you. I guess we are sure it's Wait one second, I'm sorry, apologies. Um, I am noting that, thank you, city attorney, that the third Thursday in August is August 15th, which would be two days after the Board of Supervisors meeting, which gives us some challenges from a, a noticing standpoint. And so hoping that you all would be amenable to meeting on August 22nd, which would be the fourth Thursday in August. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> On to the next slide. 